Well, hello, folks. This is Chris Van Wingerton, Senior VP of Learning Solutions here at Domino. Welcome to today's special accessibility webinar session, sponsored by the folks here at Domino. A few housekeeping items before we get started. If you'd like live caption support for today's session, you can turn on the live captioning feature in your browser. If you need help with that, there are links in the chat for Chrome, Edge, and Safari. Scroll up, find the links, uh, and the uh, the process is on the end of, other end of those links for you right there. Uh, question that everybody asks every webinar, is this being recorded? And the answer is yes. <laughs> the recording will be available right here uh, in the Crowdcast session. So you can come back if you have to leave, come back and find it again here, just log back in a Crowdcast, just return to the same event, the same link, and, uh, and you can rewatch it as much as you need to. Plus, after today's session, we're going to follow up with an email that will include all of the resources and links mentioned in today's session. Plus, we're going to also make those available on our Domino blog. Um, if you've joined us today because you're familiar with our regular webcast and podcast series, Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee, well, today's session is a bit different. Our session presenter today has joined us previously on Idiotic for some really good conversations in her area of expertise is so important, we decided we really needed to give her more time to share her insights and knowledge. <laughs> I am seeing some comments in the chat um, about not seeing or hearing anything. Um, is anybody actually hearing or seeing anything? I'm waiting to see if there's any chats or replies on that front. Maybe seeing and hearing, okay. Um, that said, Lydia, you're on the inside, aren't you? Hmm. All right. Well, we'll just keep going and see what happens here, folks. Um, Lydia, could you type into the chat, though, and check and see if anybody is seeing or hearing other than yourself? Only because you're part of our team here, so you have a different role than just an attendee. Awesome. Some folks seem to have it. Okay. <laughs> Refresh of the screen. Oh, my goodness. Hey, we do this every week here in this very same channel, and it's this week that we have some uh, some goof arounds. Okay, awesome. So folks, if you've joined us today because you're familiar with our regular webcast and podcast series, Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee, hashtag idiotic. Well, today's session is a bit different, besides the technical glitches. <laughs> <laughs> Susie's joined us a few times previously on idiotic, and we've had some really good conversations. And her area of expertise is so important that we've decided we really need to give some more time for her to share her insights and knowledge with us, a little more depth. So we're, today we're all here for Susie Miller. I'm here in a more traditional webinar host role. Brent's here too, if, uh, if you're a fan of the, the duo from Idiotic. Brent's here too. He's working the technical magic in the background today um, as our producer. And if you haven't heard of instructional designers and offices drinking coffee yet, well, there's a link in the chat way up at the top too, where you can get, you can get more information. Plus, you can also just sign up for upcoming episodes right here in our Crowdcast channel. Domino's sponsorship of, uh, of Idiotic means that Brent and I have been able to put together more than five years of weekly sessions, more than 200 episodes in total, and more than 200,000 audio downloads of the podcast recordings from the live uh, video sessions as well. We're very, very proud of that. So today, before we get to Susie's portion of our time, though, I do want to start off with a quick focus on Domino to get us going here. And I will just double check. Maybe Susie, you can let me know if you're seeing the, uh, the first crystal, comment. Crystal clear. Brilliant. Phew, I'm just a little paranoid after the, the earlier audio challenge that we had, right? Mm -hmm. Folks, for, for more than 25 years now, Domino has been creating and innovating our content authoring tools to help organizations improve performance. We had our start way back 1997 CD-ROM based e-learning courses. 
Um, and when the internet came along and became a real big thing, uh, we created one of the first learning content management systems, evolving it through many innovations to where we are today with what we describe as our Domino One content creation and knowledge management solution. At Domino, we understand that performance improvement isn't an event, it's a continuous process. Some solutions let you create content for your LMS to help employees to begin learning new tasks or new skills. Some solutions let you create content that employees can access as they work. These independent systems aren't connected, so you lose time and money making separate content, updating separate content, distributing separate content, Domino helps you create and distribute content for both of these mission critical needs, keeping it synchronized and easily distributed wherever it's needed. But if that content can't be used by everyone in your organization, then you aren't truly helping to improve performance for everyone. And a number of our innovations here at Domino have focused on helping you make sure that your content, whether it's an e-learning course for your LMS or a searchable knowledge base to help employees on the job, making sure that it's accessible for everyone. I'd like to share just one example here. Um, as you author content in Domino One, media elements that don't have sufficient accessibility support get flagged right on the page. Big exclamation mark right there. That means videos without closed captioning, audio files without transcripts, images without alt text. And you can immediately follow up by opening the accessibility tab below the authoring stage. The accessibility tab, we believe, is an industry first. In the case of an image, you can add alt text and screen reader text right away. You can also control whether the selected element should be part of the tab order for, for screen reader and keyboard users. Plus, the accessibility tab also includes contextual information, tips, best practices for the type of element you've selected. This is critically important. Susie is going to tell us today, accessibility is more than a simple set of checkboxes, and there is always more to learn. And the accessibility tab is there to help you improve the accessibility of your content, whether you're an expert or a novice. So for an image, the accessibility tab explains how a screen reader will encounter the image and use the accessibility information we've provided. Alternately, for a text element, the accessibility tab explains how your choice of text element settings help structure your content on the page and how that structure helps a screen reader um, make sense of the information on the page. And the accessibility tab is there for every type of on-page element ready for you. Tips, best practices, settings, et cetera, as you go. The accessibility tab is just one example of the many tools and features available in Domino One to help your team create content that is truly accessible and that can truly help improve performance for everyone in your organization. We've come a long way from the days when too many folks thought accessibility just meant having a PDF copy of your course available for download. I will switch that off. We'll come back to the real people here. <laughs> okay, time for our main event here. Susie Miller is a longtime friend of Domino's, and she's been a guest on Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee previously. She's the author of Designing Accessible Learning Content, a Practical Guide to Applying Best Practice Accessibility Standards to L&D Resources. And uh, no less an authority in our space than Dr. Jane Bozart described it as, quote, just a remarkable help for those of us concerned with digital accessibility, end quote, in her review of the book for the Learning Guild last year. Um, that's a primo thumbs up from, from, from Dr. Bozart right there. No matter how many times we've had Susie on for a conversation about accessibility, there's always more to discuss. So we decided to set up today's session for some more focus time on accessibility. Susie, we're so glad to have you as our guest for today's session. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. One last housekeeping thing before you jump in, Susie. Folks, if you have questions, add them to the chat or even the question feature right here in Crowdcast. We'll do our best to weave some questions into the session as we go, but we're definitely going to have time at the end for, for QA to follow up on things that might still be, be lingering around. So, and now, Susie, over to you. <laughs> now, my cue. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let me just make sure that you can see presentation. I think we practiced earlier and it was taking a few seconds to load, wasn't it? So. Mm -hmm.
while we're waiting for that, I will say hello to everybody in the chat. Lots of idiotic, uh, idiotic family members who have joined us for this session here today too. Okay, let me try again. Brilliant. Just just a few technical gremlins then to, to keep us on our toes. Oh, I know. Nothing is perfect. I... <laughs> okay. Well, let me make a start. So I just want to start really by um, welcoming you all to uh, this masterclass in accessible and inclusive learning content. And I also just wanted to start by thanking both Chris and Brent for inviting me to run this session for you today. And really to thank you all for giving up your var very valuable time to find out more about making learning content both accessible and inclusive, whether you're joining us live or watching a recording. Okay, what we'll do to begin with, uh, I'll just begin by what we're going to cover in the session today. So I'm going to start by setting the scene and addressing a few key issues. We'll start with introductions and then move on to a useful definition and some important points around the case for making learning content accessible. I'll then move on to some key insights and outline how accessible learning content leads to better learning practitioners and better experiences for everyone. Next, I'll focus on the taking action section with some practical tips on improving both the accessibility and inclusivity of content. And we'll finish with some key takeaways and the opportunity for some questions if we have time. So as, as Chris said, uh, he's going to be keeping an eye on the chat as we're going through. We've agreed that if he sees anything that uh, is vital as, as I'm going through the presentation, that he's going to uh, do his best to stop me, maybe when I'm, I'm taking breath and, and ask those questions as we're going along. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go. So what we'll do is move on now to our introductory scene setting section. So I'll just start with a bit more background about my own learning journey and how I came to be so passionate about, passionate about accessibility. I've been involved in learning and development for over 30 years. I started as an English teacher and then became an IT systems trainer and finally focused on designing and developing digital learning content. I've worked across the public, private and charity sectors and also in higher education. So it was my experience there working as an instructional designer, which made me realize just how little support there was for people who wanted to make their learning content accessible. This was one of the many reasons I decided to start my own company, Ella Hub, and that's driven by the only slightly ambitious vision of making all learning content accessible and inclusive as the default. It was also the reason I wrote my book, Designing Accessible Learning Content, or DALC for short. I wanted there to be a resource which was available for anyone, especially practitioners like me, who wanted practical support to help them apply technical accessibility standards to learning content. So for the best part of nine years now, I've been focused on digital learning accessibility, how to train it, how to make it come alive, how to change behavior, and how to embed accessibility so that it doesn't go away. Another important part of my introduction is why I became so passionate about this subject. I always think it's vital to start any session on accessibility with a focus on the people it affects. In my experience, this is the spark which makes accessibility come alive and motivates people to get on board. It's also one of the vital ingredients which makes accessibility stick. So in my case, the spark was a student called Farisai Moyo he was in my A-level English literature class when I was teaching in a high school in Zimbabwe early on in my teaching career. Because Farisai was blind, she had a reader who led, read out her literature text to her. And this was another girl in our class called Mercy. So this is Farisai and Mercy that you can see on the screen. Sooner after, after I started teaching her, I realized that having to rely on Mercy to read out her texts was holding Farisai back. Because we didn't have access to assistive technology at the time, we managed to get Farisai's literature texts in Braille. The autonomy and the independence in her learning that this gave Farisai had a huge impact on her. She went on to pass her A-level and eventually trained to be a teacher herself. To explain the impact that working with Farisai had on me, I'm just going to read out an extract from my book. I spent such a long time writing and rewriting this paragraph to get it just right, 
but I wanted to share it with you as it touches on some key concepts about accessibility before we get started. But working with Farisai was one of the greatest privileges in my career. The experience forced me to reevaluate all of my assumptions about teaching and learning. It taught me to be more aware of the needs of my students and made me realize how important it was to be able to adapt to those needs, ultimately making me a better teacher. Even more importantly, however, it made me rethink my attitude to disability. Working with Farisai showed me that her impairment in the form of her blindness was not in itself something which disabled her. She was just as bright and capable as the other students in the class, but with strategies and accommodations which allowed her to become more confident and independent, she was able to fulfill her potential. So this leads me on to a, a definition of disability, which I found to be really useful before moving on to explore accessibility in more detail. Farisai's story is a great demonstration of the social model of disability. And this is based on the idea that disability is caused by barriers which are created when products and services are not designed to include people with different access needs. If these barriers are removed, then someone who is disabled can have an equal experience to everyone else. For me, this dis definition of disability from the UNCRPD does a great job in articulating this concept. It says that persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So this focus on barriers, I think, is a vitally important theme when we consider accessibility. And this is because if disability is partly caused by barriers, then every single one of us has the ability to find out about those barriers and enable equal access for all of our learners by removing them. And I believe that's the power of accessibility. At a time when we're acutely aware of the problems we face as a society, accessibility gives us the power to make a hugely positive impact on the lives of so many people. And this is why part of this session and every session I deliver focuses on some practical accessibility tips that anyone can implement. But before we move on to those practical tips, I just want to take a bit of time to focus on the case for accessibility. Although I appreciate that many of you here will already be aware of the benefits of making digital and learning content accessible, I found that it really helps if I highlight a few key organisational benefits at the beginning of a session. I think it helps to, to engage people and make sure that everyone is on board. And this is a technique I thoroughly recommend if you find yourself having to advocate for accessibility in your organisation, something that anyone who is passionate about accessibility will, I'm sure, have already experienced. So I've pulled out the top three benefits which I found to have the most impact. The first is a focus on how accessibility can help organisations enhance their reputation. The basis of this case is that it is unethical and contrary to human rights to unnecessarily exclude people from any aspect of life. Many people are aware that making learning content accessible is just the right thing to do, but not so many might be aware that this is a concept which is enshrined in international law, again by the UNCRPD. This exists to enable persons with disabilities to live independently and participate fully in all aspects of life. An important aspect of the UNCRPD, which many people aren't aware of, is that Article 9 specifically refers to access to information and communications technologies and systems as a fundamental human right. Another strong argument for this case is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. These were adapted by the UN, sorry, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2015. And they include 17 goals building on the principle of leaving no one behind. The SDGs explicitly include disability and persons with disabilities 11 times. The one we shout out most at Ella Hub is number 10, reduced inequalities. It really means a lot to us that we're part of a global movement for sustainable change. Let's move on now to the legal case. This is where accessibility tends to, to most commonly sit for organisations. And I think that's a real shame because it promotes the mindset that accessibility is a risk and a constraint rather than an opportunity. But it's definitely an important consideration that we need to be aware of. 
If we have a quick look now at, the, at an overview of the international, international web accessibility laws and policies from W3C, you may be able to see a common theme. And that is that the most legislation is underpinned by the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. This is why the W3 state that the WCAG standards are a single shared standard for web content accessibility that meets the needs of individuals, organisations and governments internationally. We don't have time in this session to explore the legal side of accessibility in detail, but I think it's always a useful reminder that meeting accessibility standards is a legal requirement for many organisations and it's increasingly considered best practice for everyone else. My last point, and one that I think is becoming more and more important for organisations, is that a commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion is only really legitimate if it encompasses all lenses of diversity, and that includes disability. So to explore this, what we're going to do is look at some statistics now from the World Economic Forum. So in research carried out in 2019, they found that 90% of companies prioritise diversity, but what percentage do you think consider disability? So we have three options here, 4%, 14% or 24%. You don't need to put anything in the chat. I just want you to have a guess for yourself. So in actual fact, only a staggering 4% consider disability. Now, I'm not quite sure how those figures would stand today, but judging by my own experience about how many organisations really understand and create legally accessible learning content, I would guess that it's 4% is probably quite an accurate estimate. Which brings me to my last slide in this section, and it's a fantastic takeaway from an organisation called Disability is Diversity. They make the point that there is no diversity, equity and inclusion without disability. And of course, that also means accessibility. So their, cam their campaign is aimed at the entertainment industry in the US, but I think it's equally relevant in the, uh, for the L&D industry or indeed for any organisation who seek to have a legitimate commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion. So that concludes our scene setting section. I hope it's been a useful introduction and it's helped to highlight some of the organisational benefits of making learning content accessible before we move on. So my next section is called key insights and I think one of the things that really struck me or I should say more accurately added to my imposter syndrome when I was writing DELC was that I only really had my own experience and that of a handful of other colleagues that I could draw on. Since then, my work with Ella Harb has given me the immense privilege of working with a whole range of organisations who are committed to making their digital and their learning content both accessible and inclusive. I've put together this infographic to give you an idea of the scope of what we've delivered over the last few years. And crucially, that includes providing support to over 55 UK, European and international clients. As this selection of some of our clients shows, this has included organisations in the private, public or federal, charity and education sectors, and also L&D providers. And this is where the real learning has taken place. Providing consultancy, auditing and especially training has allowed me some incredibly valuable insights, both into the benefits of accessible learning content, but also into the issues that people are having making their learning content accessible. So what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the session are the key insights that I've learned from that experience. As Maya Angelou once said, do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. So when I wrote DALC, I was doing the best I could at the time. Now, particularly after seeing so many examples of non-accessible content made accessible, I can do even better. So we'll start off with my number one evidence-based key insight which is that creating accessible learning content definitely, unequivocally, and 100% leads to better learning practitioners. This is something that I've been convinced of for a long time, but I'm aware, I'm aware that that's an easy uh, claim to make. So I'm now gonna take the opportunity to share how both the evidence that I've gained from working with so many organizations and my own experience as a learning practitioner backs this up. So in the case of my own experience, I've spent the last eight months working on transforming my book into an interactive and fully accessible online self-access programme. You'll see quite a lot of examples from this as I go through the presentation. I'll give you more details about how you can get involved with the taster module of that programme at the end of this session. 
So working on this resource has given me the opportunity to really walk the walk and talk the talk for accessible learning content. And it's undoubtedly made me a much better learning practitioner. I've also had feedback from many of the delegates that I've trained that they've experienced the same thing. So how does designing and developing accessible learning content make better learning practitioners? First and most importantly, finding out how to make learning content accessible shifts the emphasis to a focus on the learner because considering accessibility is a fundamental and transformational shift which puts learners at the center of the, center of the learning experience. In other words, it encourages learning practitioners to think with empathy about their learning audience. This is particularly the case in my own experience. This is our screen reader te tester, Kirsty Wolf. Now she runs her own language training and podcasting business. She has a lived experience of a disability and she's been using screen readers and assistive technology for over 20 years. Working closely with Kirsty has been transformational in shifting my focus onto the experience of the learner. It's now impossible for me to design learning content without considering the different ways that my learners will access the learning experiences that I'm creating. And for organisations who don't have access to working with people with lived experiences of a disability, even just encouraging them to work with access needs personas, particularly using the many uh, video resources that you can find on platforms like Vimeo um, or YouTube, really does has led to an in, a noticeable improvement in their focus on putting learners at the centre of the learning experience. The second reason I've identified that leads to better learning practitioners is because it forces you to challenge your existing practice. The best way that I found of describing what happens when you find out about accessibility comes from a quote from the uh, writer Alvin Toffler. And he said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. Now, while not everyone might agree with the concepts of unlearning and relearning. It really is the best description I've found of what happens to your practice as an instructional designer and developer when you start designing accessible learning content. It just shifts the narrative from I'm doing this because it's the way I've always done it to I'm doing this because it benefits my learners. So to give you an example of what that can look like, uh, this is a case study from my work with the L&D team of, of a government client. And it demonstrates how accessibility training had a positive impact on the screen recording content in their learning resources. So the department created a lot of instructional videos on how to use systems. Before their accessibility training, a lot of those screen recordings were created without a great deal of preparation. But as soon as the practitioners realized that they needed to add captions and transcripts to the videos, it made them create a script for each of them. And that not only made it much more efficient to make the actual content accessible, but it also led to much more planned and professional recordings. Another hugely important benefit for learning practitioners is that because you have to think differently, it leads to innovation. A profound change in mindset is when you realize that accessibility equals innovation and not limitation. So I'll share one of my own examples now. This was an interactivity I created uh, for a student um, at, at a university setting. And this was a case where there was a clear learning justification for using a drag, drag and drop interactivity because we really wanted to, um, to reinforce the use of recycling bins um, on campus. So because the drag, drag and drop activity in the authoring tool wasn't accessible, I combined an accessible multiple response question with animation paths to create the drag and drop interactivity which was accessible both to keyboard and screen reader users. So as you can see, this project was shortlisted for a Learning Technologies Award. It's really my best argument to prove that accessibility can lead to great learning because it leads to thinking differently and to innovation. So those are just a few key ways that I found that designing content which is accessible leads to better learning practitioners. But here's the thing, those better learning practitioners are designing and developing better learning experiences for everyone. Because accessible learning content definitely unequivocally and 100% leads to better learning experiences for all learners, including people who have disabilities and access needs. So let's find out a bit more about why that is now. We'll start with the benefit you'd probably expect, and that is that accessible learning content includes people with a whole range of access needs. 
And for digital content, we most often divide those into vision, hearing, motor, cog and cognitive access needs. Uh, and then also we just have a few examples of the huge range of conditions that could affect any of our learners, uh, current learners or future learners. So we could have things for a vision could be blindness, low vision and um, colour blindness, um, uh, conditions like glaucoma, cataracts, for hearing that in could include deafness, hearing loss, acoustic trauma, auditory processing disorder, things like tinnitus, for example. Motor, this affects manual dexterity when we're talking about this in the, in the digital content. So things like limb differences, arthritis, MS, RSI, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's tremors, for example. Cognitive, a whole range of different issues, things like uh, neurodivergent conditions such as dyslexia, uh, ADHD, autism, things that are affected by flashing content like epilepsy or moving content like vestibular disorder, and then a whole range of mental health issues like such as depression. So as I say, these are just a very few examples of the, of the complete oh, huge range of conditions that could affect um, us or our learners at any time. So according to some very interesting recent research by the Boston Consultancy um, Consulting Group that, that involved nearly 28,000 employees across 16 countries, most organisations typically estimate that this applies to somewhere between 4% and 7% of their staff. However, the actual figure was closer to 25% of employees identifying as having a disability or a health condition. So we're very often unaware of the prevalence of disability in our organisations because according to the global charity Hidden Disabilities, and they use the sunflower symbol to help people show they have a disability which you can't see, up to 80% of disabilities are non-visible. And remember also that the population ageing predicted by the UN to be one of the most significant social transformations of the 21st century, it's absolutely crucial that we make our learning content suitable for a workforce who will naturally experience a range of access needs as they get older. But even without the ageing factor, accessibility is vital for future-proofing our content because, according to the Employers Forum on Disability, 2% of the working, working age population becomes disabled um, every year and 78% of disabled uh, people acquire their impairment age 16 or over. So to summarise then, making our learning content accessible is the only way we can make sure we're including everyone in our workforce and audience which will most definitely already have people with disabilities and access needs in it now. And it's also the only way we can be certain our learning content is fit for purpose for our potential workforce and audience of the future. So that's why I believe it's so important to adopt an accessibility as the default approach. So let's move on now to our next tangible benefit of accessible learning content, and that is that it caters for our learners' circumstances, environments and preferences. We'll start with circumstantial or temporary access needs. So see if you can have a think now about some temporary circumstances that might affect the ability of your learners to interact with content. And we'll do that by focusing again on the four different access needs categories. So the picture on the screen may give you a clue as to a temporary motor access need. So we could have something which stops you being able to use your mouse, such as an injured hand or wrist. We could also have a vision impairment, which could be things such as blurred vision due to eye surgery, hay fever, a particular favourite of mine is uh, losing my reading glasses. We can have hearing loss due to a head cold, exposure to loud noise, blocked ears, for example. And we can have um, impaired cognitive ability due to tiredness, stress and anxiety, something that I'm sure um, all of us have experienced. So remember, these are things that could affect any of us or any of our learners at any time. So let's move on now to situational or environmental access needs. And for this one, we'll focus specifically on things which could affect people who are interacting with our learning content. Again, the picture is an example of a motor access need, one you might recognise from COVID and lockdowns. So we have learning while caring for children when home working. For vision access needs, we could have learning on site with sunlight obscuring the screen or slow internet when working at home, which prevents pictures from downloading. For hearing access need, we could have learning on a noisy factory floor. And for cognitive access need, we could have learning in a distracting home or office environment. 
But I think it's important to say at this point that many disabled learners can find it frustrating when we use temporary and situational access needs to justify making our learning content accessible. I completely understand this point of view, but I think one advantage it does have is that it shifts the emphasis away from us versus them thinking and moves it simply to us thinking. Accessibility is something that can benefit any of us or any of our learners at any time. So by making our learning content accessible, we automatically cater to our learners' circumstances and environments, but it can also help us to accommodate different learner preferences. And this is because in order to make our learning content accessible, we very often provide alternative ways of accessing the content. So we'll have a look in that action now in an example from the DALC programme. So this example shows a scenario block which is not accessible for someone who uses a screen reader. To make it accessible, I've provided a text alternative version to the scenario in an accordion block. But I've designed the block so that it still gives learners the opportunity to reflect and consider before I give the suggested correct answer and feedback. So this alternative would work equally well for a screen reader user or for a learner who didn't want to work through every stage of scenario activity. I'll never forget the feedback I once had from a learner who told me on their evaluation form that they loathed and detested scenario interactivities. But this approach of providing our learners with alternative methods of accessing content also lies at the heart of Universal Design for Learning, or UDL. Now, this is a well-recognized and established framework designed to optimize learning for everyone, and it's based on scientific insights into how humans learn. So central to the UDL framework is the principle of providing multiple means of engagement, representation and action and expression. So ultimately, accessible learning content adapts to a range of circumstances, environments and preferences, and it caters for a wider audience and provides a richer learning experience for everyone. Another thing that accessible learning content does is tackle common complaints about e-learning. Although, of course, not always the case, I think it's true to say that many of us are aware that digital learning doesn't always have the best reputation. So unlike UDL, which is based on scientific insights, the, this list of common complaints is based on nothing more than a quick poll of some of my connections on LinkedIn. And these are some of the, the most common issues that they identified. So poor colour contrast, making content difficult to read, stressful and unhelpful assessments, distracting moving transitions and content, locked or difficult to navigate content, and distracting narration on slides. And here's the thing about these complaints. They can all be fixed by following the standards and recommendations set out in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So that brings us to our final benefit of um, accessible learning content, which is that it leads naturally to inclusive learning. But before we explore that further, we just need to unpack the difference between the two. Although I used to use them interchangeably, my experience over the last few years has been instrumental, really, in demonstrating the difference between them, you know, how and why they're different. Because even if we follow WCAG standards and make our learning content um, accessible, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's inclusive. As this still from um, the video accessibility versus inclusion shows, if we just focus on accessibility, it can be the equivalent of a person in a wheelchair being shown to their restaurant table through the kitchen and past the toilets, whilst their companions are welcomed through the front door. But in my experience, by focusing on accessibility, you naturally start creating inclusive content. And that is learning that provides a welcoming, engaging and enjoyable experience for everyone. This is learning when no one feels excluded or has a lesser experience than anyone else. And of course, in its widest sense, that means considering every lens of DE&I. But for the purposes of this session, we're going to focus just on people with disabilities and access needs. So we'll look now at some tangible ways that we can do this, tangible ways that we can make our content more inclusive. So here are just a few of the inclusive learning recommendations that we make to clients in our audits. You'll notice that none of them are about meeting WCAG standards. They all just focus on how we can make learners with access needs feel welcomed and considered. 
So the first, adding an accessibility statement, is a legal requirement for many organisations. But even if it isn't, it's a fantastic way of showing that you're committed to accessibility and are doing your best to consider everyone's access needs. Another thing we suggest is using inclusive language, which doesn't, which doesn't make assumptions about how people interact with content. So you might, might be aware of things like using select instead of click or enter instead of type, for example. One to avoid now, and that is using text all in capital letters. According to gov.uk, this makes it between 13 and 18 percent more difficult for all learners to read, but it's particularly difficult for some people with dyslexia. Most of us know how uh, to avoid this um, in our day to day digital content because it's considered similar to shouting, but we still see a lot of examples of content authors shouting in our audits. Another very common recommendation we make is, the org is that organisations use imagery which includes every lens of DE&I and that means including people with a range of access needs, not just the one token stock image of someone in a wheelchair that we often see in our audits. And finally, using plain language. We'll take a bit of time to explore this one in more depth now, not only because it comes up repeatedly in our audits, but also because it has such a big impact on making sure that everyone has a positive learning experience. So for me, using readability checkers has been transformational in improving my, in improving my own learning content. Although these are built into many of the tools that we use every day, I found two websites particularly helpful. First is the Hemingway site, which is useful if you're writing your own content because it gives you recommendations on how you can make your language more straightforward. The second is from WebFX and it's useful because it gives a very clear visual score on lots of readability indices. Now, I found this one hugely helpful if I'm working with subject matter experts who may give me very complex language, which I'm trying to work with them um, to simplify. And one practical tip from my own work recently on the, on the DALT programme is a method of how to simplify language if it gets identified as being too complex by a readability checker. I personally find this can be very time consuming, something I really struggle with. So partly because I couldn't do a presentation in 2023 and not mention AI, but mainly because I have found it very helpful myself. I ask ChatGPT to write my language to different reading levels and then use in an amalgamation of my own words and simplified sentences um, from chat GB, uh, GBT to come up with a content at a good reading level that I'm happy with. OK, so having looked at the, uh, at the inclusivity recommendations, what we will do now is move on to look uh, in more detail at the practical accessibility tips. So you'll notice that the recommendations for making content uh, more inclusive that we've just focused on promote positive learning experience for everyone and they ensure that everyone with access needs feels considered and welcome. None of them are WCAG standards that you can pass or fail, but this is exactly what we're going to focus on in this next practical accessibility tips, the tips section. So all of the tips we're going to look at now will help us to pass one of the 50 WCAG level A or double A standards, which, as we mentioned earlier, are a legal requirement for many organisations and best practice for everyone else. I've chosen the particular issues that we'll focus on because I want to make sure that we cover the full range of access needs, vision, hearing, motor and cognitive. And also because they all feature in uh, our Ella Hub list of the 10 most common WCAG standard fails that we identify in our audits. So we have colour contrast between text and background, colour alone used, especially for feedback, no captions used or captions not synchronised, descriptive or accurate, inaccessible interactions used, for example, drag and drop interactions, and then moving content with no learner control. So we'll start with a standard which includes people with a whole range of vision access needs. And I'm sure this is one which is very familiar to many of you, but I think it's still worth being aware of or, or, or reminding you of, because it's still one of the most common WCAG standard violations which we come across in the audits we carry out. Although there aren't any statistics for accessibility in the L&D industry, I'd imagine if there were, they would be similar to those that you can find in the Web AIM Million Report, which every year analyzes the accessibility of the top million global websites. In their 2022 report, they identified that a huge 83.9% of home pages still failed the requirement for color contrast between text and background color. 
So the key thing to be aware of when it comes to making colour accessible is that it applies to the contrast ratio between two colours. The minimum WCAG contrast ratio for text in the background it appears on is at least 4.5 to 1. Of course, that's difficult to check just by relying on your own vision. To have a guess now whether you think the white text against the pale green circle background in this infographic would have good contrast and pass the standard or poor contrast and fail the standard. Okay, so let's check now to see if you were right. So this is the Web AIM Color Contrast Checker. There are many available, but this is one that I recommend partly because it's, it's just a website. You don't need to download anything. So you can either just manually enter the color values of the colors you're working with if you have them. But if you don't have the color values you're working with, it's exceptionally super quick and easy to check the contrast between your text and the background it's on. And I'll show, that's how, I'll show you how that's done now. It's simply a case of using the color picking tool to pick up the color value of the background and then the text, and then selecting enter to find out if your color combination passes or fail the WCAG standard at different levels. So you can see that the color contrast ratio for the white against the green was only 2.22 to one. Uh, and, and not at least 4.5 to 1. So this would fail in an audit and also be really difficult for many of your learners to see. But another reason we love this colour contrast checker is because it makes it so easy to correct your colour choices. And again, I'll show you how now. So you can see it has a lightness slider for each colour, which means you can simply lighten or darken your chosen colours until you get the colour values which pass the WCAG standard. And hopefully that's doing that now. Brilliant. Okay, so if it's so easy to do, why do so many organisations still get it so wrong? This is where my consultancy work delivered some useful insights. What I found is that organisations very often have a colour brand palette which looks similar to this, with just a selection of individual colours that can be used. Whereas what people actually need is a brand palette which analyses each of the colours in combination and identifies which pass and which fail. Luckily, there is a colour contrast checker which does exactly this. It allows organisations to provide workable, accessible brand guidelines around um, colour. And it's also useful for practitioners who want to make sure that they're using their brand colours to avoid issues with their text against background if they don't have an organisational one. So this brings us to our next common issue for vision access needs. And this time we're going to focus on learners who have colour vision deficiency, CVD, otherwise known as colour blindness. And this example shows how conveying information using colour alone can make it impossible to process if an answer is right or wrong. Because the answer changes colour to red if it's placed in the wrong segment of the Venn diagram and to green if it's in the correct segment of the diagram, this would fail the WCAG standard. This is because it's using only colour and not using any other devices such as text or icons to convey this information. That means that someone who is colourblind would very likely not be able to interpret this information. This is how someone with protonopia or red blind colour deficiency would see this feedback. And you can see it's barely possible to distinguish between the correct and the incorrect answers. So this image was created with a colourblind simulator but you don't actually need one of those to check your, your uh, use of colour for feedback. A top practical tip to check this standard is simply to apply grayscale to your content. You can see a similar issue in example A for this slide feedback, which only uses a red overlay to tell learners that they've answered the question incorrectly. In contrast, because example B uses text and an icon to supplement this information, this feedback would pass the standard and again, you can see how applying grayscale can help you to double check this standard really quickly and easily. So next, we have one of the most important standards needed to include people with hearing access needs, and that's captions. The first issue, issue which I'm still I have to admit staggered to find sometimes is that some videos and learning content still don't have captions at all. This corresponds with research that was shared with me by the charity Scope a few years ago. They identified that a lack of captions was the number one barrier to um, equal uh, access to learning content in workplace learning. But even if organisations do provide captions, we still see some common issues which prevent the captions from providing an equivalent learning experience and therefore meeting the guidelines. So it's a worth a reminder that captions need to be synchronised to the action. So just providing a transcript isn't enough. 
They also need to be descriptive, which means they contain things like important sound effects, who's speaking and emotions conveyed by a tone of voice, which someone who's deaf or hard of hearing may miss. And finally, and where we see by far the most issue in our audits, is that those captions must also be accurate with punctuation and no mistakes so that they're easy to process and understand. Many organisations fail the caption standard in accessibility audits because they use videos with auto-generated captions which don't have any punctuation but do have many grammar and spelling errors. Let's move on now to another common issue which we often find in our audits and this time it affects people with motor access needs. So we'll begin with a montage showing some different conditions which affect manual dexterity, both permanent and situational. These images are also a useful reminder of the various different assistive technologies that people with motor access needs use to interact with digital content. To include all of these learners and the whole range of assistive technology they use, we need to make sure that all of our content is keyboard accessible. Most of this is controlled by the authoring tool that we use, but one thing that we do need to, uh, to be aware of as practitioners is to find out about which of the interactions provided by our tool are keyboard accessible. Activities such as drag and drop interactions very often aren't keyboard accessible, but often there are, are alternatives provided, such as the matching interactivity that you can see here with Domino 1. So to meet this standard, practitioners need to avoid interactivity which isn't keyboard accessible, or if they do use it, they need to provide an accessible alternative. And finally, for cognitive needs, we have a standard which benefits everyone, but it's particularly important for people who have neurodivergent conditions such as dyslexia, ADHD or autism. So this very aptly named pause, stop or hide standard means that if there is any content which starts automatically, lasts for longer than five seconds and appears alongside other content which learners are trying to process, they must be able to pause, stop or hide that moving content. This example shows exactly that. If learners can control the movement, as they can here using the pause button, then this content would pass the standard. If they can't, which is often the case in our audits, it would fail. So I hope everyone, regardless of your role with learning, has managed to find something useful from those practical tips on making learning content inclusive and accessible. I'm just going to finish now with a couple of key takeaways that I'd like to leave you with. The first is that accessibility can very often feel overwhelming. And I hope this masterclass has helped to make it a bit less so, but a mantra that I repeatedly come back to myself and suggest to all of our clients is progress over perfection. Things very probably won't be where they need to be now, and you will very probably make mistakes as you try and make your learning content more accessible and inclusive. I know I certainly have in the past and continue, and continue to do so. But every small step you take will have a huge impact on your learners. And this leads me nicely to my next takeaway, which is never to underestimate the positive impact you're making, uh, you're having by making your learning content accessible and inclusive. It's what I secretly call the joy of accessibility, and it's the magic ingredient which turns accessibility from complex technical standards into something that really can change the world. So in a moment, Brent is going to demonstrate this by playing an extract from a song from the DALT programme. It was recorded by someone called David MacDonald to celebrate WCAG version 2, first being released in 2008, an astonishing 15 years ago. So if you remember nothing else from this presentation, I hope it's this song. So Brent, if you could play the clip now, that would be great. We've got a brand new specification. It works with the tool of verification. It makes the web accessible, you know we made it testable. The wig, wig, wig. It's gonna make the web understandable. And make it perceivable and make it tangible. When it's interoperable, the web will be unstoppable. The wig, wig, wig. Brilliant. One difference with uh, a regular idiotic episode in today was that, uh, of course, we didn't start out with theme music, but now I got my <laughs> dancing in. <laughs> Brilliant. So just, just one final slide and then we're done. Mm -hmm. Sorry.
So uh, yes, my last uh, slide in this presentation is just really a call to action. So as well as choosing one action, or sometimes we call it a micro commitment to implement from the things that you might have seen in this presentation, another thing that you can do to contribute to making all learning content accessible and inclusive as the default is to take part in the DALP program um, taster module. So you can sign up at the link that we'll provide after the session and you'll get access to seven free showcase lessons from the program and a digital bad, digital badge if you provide us with feedback. So we've already had some great recommendations which have made a real difference to making our program more accessible and more inclusive for everyone. So we'd love to hear from you, especially if you're a learning practitioner or you have an access need. Okay. Awesome. And as Susie mentioned, we will share that link among the, along with all the other links to the tools and resources that she's mentioned here today in our follow-up email. There'll also be on the Domino blog as a follow-up too, if that's uh, easier for you to find, et cetera. Susie, thank you so much for walking through these key points and ideas. Um, the, the chat has been full of ideas as well, <clears throat> including quite a number of uh, awesome thumbs up as you brought up certain things and people, you know, we could see some light bulbs going off for folks uh, as we went through things here. Yeah, um, we do have a little bit of time left here. So uh, there, and there were a couple of questions posted to the actual question panel. So let me go to the right button. Sometimes I work on. <laughs> um, there was a question about uh, re revisiting the the drag and drop uh, activity alternative that you that you showed earlier. So okay. folks to maybe just learn a little bit more about or understand it a little bit more about what you did with that. So. Okay. Did you want me to bring that up? Sure. And and while you do that, there is also a question: um, uh, Is there software we can use to create appropriate captions? Um, and one of the tricks that uh, I know a lot of teams will do is, is load it up into YouTube, which will generate uh, a closed captioning file, which you can then copy paste basically from there um, as a way to, um, to to get around. You know, there's a lot of work. You also mentioned the fact that, oh, if you're doing it right, you've written the script <laughs> from yeah. the start and you've already got the caption file and you just have to, you know, massage in the timings on that. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Let me just get to the right place in no my worries. before I start going. Yeah, so, so we're we're backing up to how you were designed a multiple array. Uh, okay. I, well, I'll probably do is just just describe that really rather than, sure. than, than show it if that's okay. So yes. Yeah, so really, um, the. Uh, what happens with it with a drag and drop interactivity is the fact that it isn't accessible for people who use screen readers and it's obviously uh, also not accessible for people with motor access needs who drag uh, who, who aren't able to use a mouse to drag objects the interesting thing about the um people who are have got motor access needs is that we sometimes forget that they're actually visual learners so they 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 are using their keyboard to interact with content but they can see what's on the um they can see what's on the on the screen so the reason for the kind of solution that i came up with was we wanted to make sure that even people who were, who had motor access needs who were using a keyboard to to um look at that or, or to interact with the content were still getting that idea of moving things that idea of you know Obviously, we can't, you know, you know, from a learning point of view, we wanted to reinforce the fact that, that things needed to go into um, recycling. So we were trying to kind of show that that was recycling. So the the the, um, the idea of having the um, the animation paths was that when they were using the, the keyboard to interact with the content, as soon as they selected, uh, which they could do when we use one of the well, the interactions was a multiple option, which was, was which was accessible. As soon as they selected that option, they put the tick in the box. Then it had a trigger to move the uh, to move the content into the kind of right, uh, you know, into into the recycling. So as I say, that was the the for me trying to work at. OK, how am I going to make sure that I'm including people who've got motor access needs who I still want to have a very similar experience to that drag and drop? And also somebody who's using um, a screen reader and that um, that particular interactive interactivity was also screen reader friendly. So it would just read out, um, you know, whether whether you had the, bot, the what was selected. And then obviously when you hit submit, it would tell you what the answers were. So you as a screen reader user, obviously the, the visual side of that wasn't wasn't essential, but it would still work for a screen reader. Yeah, and your example does have a spatial relationship. Like you're trying to have people picture the activity of putting the right things, in this case, into a recycling yeah. container. Well, here's my soapbox, folks. We, we 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 use drag and drops and those sorts of things because we feel that there's um, I don't know a level of engagement or something. But truthfully, um, my own opinion, flag asterisk, all those things. 
you know, drag and drops have a validity when there's a spatial relationship to the content, um, but simply asking people to sort things into two different categories, there are a number of different ways to achieve the same results. Putting aside the fact that that kind of categorization isn't necessarily applicable to, you know, it's it's a lower level, um, almost mm -hmm. a rote memorization kind of skill anyway. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting, yeah. Yeah, as, as our own Paul uh, Schneider is throwing in, I think we get stuck with something about dragging and dropping is special from a learning perspective, yeah. <laughs> it's that whole argument, if you look beyond the, beyond learning and development and look, say, mm -hmm. to the gaming industry and, uh, you know, and to, to the amazing yeah. things from an innovation sure. point of view, we do yeah. tend to, we do tend to get a bit stuck on our drag and drop, I agree with you, yeah. We, we're getting a bit close to our, uh, our okay. closing time here. There was a question as well about using chat GPT for, um, helping generate content for specific audiences, but no one here is actually an expert in chat GPT. So the only okay. way to learn that would be to dig in folks and uh, maybe even give it a whirl and see what's there. But as I, as I mentioned in my response to that, it might also just reveal the bias of, of the content that the chat GPT was trained on. If it just doesn't, um, hasn't encountered accessible content, it might not even know what to do uh, with that, which yeah. I think also can be seen as a statement um, on, accessible content in general in our world, maybe. Yeah, I have, mm. I have heard that there's some interesting um, research being done on um, working with, with people who, who have dyslexia. So uh, mm. that's, I haven't had a chance to dig into that more, but it's, it's certainly, you know, certainly really interesting. <laughs> Peter's mentioning in the chat, I always treat chat, chat GPT as an intern. Check what you get. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, um, I don't see any more questions. We're, we are closing into the top of our time today, folks. As we've mentioned a few times, we will send out a follow-up email uh, with all of the resources and links mentioned in today's session. Plus, we're going to post those all, all this stuff up on the uh, the Domino blog as well. Um, but and before we close our, up the session, I want to once again thank our sponsors here today, at Domino. If your team is struggling to meet the accessibility needs of your learning audience, please book a demo time, and we'll walk you through how Domino One can help with that and a lot more. Um, Susie, thanks so much. I'm so glad that we've been able to, to put together this time. As I mentioned, your, your visits with us on Idiotic um, have always been, well, we're more conversational. We get, a, we get a lot of great discussion, but not maybe as much a practical application. It was fabulous to be able to bring more of that forward here today. As always, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate the, uh, your generosity and your spirit of sharing. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it and for everyone who's, who's joined us as well. Excellent. Folks, as well, thank you for the great chat today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest, your focus. Um, and we'll catch you again very soon. Thanks all. Have a great day, folks.